Pola than the Piggy, Injilum, Paul Willem Yuba, Paul Willems, and Yuma Tanga called Cabbage Mujuba, Kunzu colleagues, Paul Willems, Injilum. Your Holiness, where this morning we have been speaking about the modes of attention, but still there is not quite a clear understanding of what, what attention really is. And we hope that we can elucidate now what attention is from at least the Pani, Pali Canon side. And we're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Rupert Geffen here. He's from the University Buddhist Studies of um, Bristol, and he's also the president of the Pali Pali Text Society. And he has written many articles and a wonderful book as an introduction to Buddhism, which is extremely accessible for um, Westerners particularly, to understand what is actually the thought of Buddhism. And I'm really excited to listen now to Rupert's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diego. Uh, it's a great honor of me, for me to uh, um, be invited and to talk to Your Holiness. Um, I find myself in a very odd position trying to explain Buddhism to you. Um, <laughs> that is the... the, uh, the but, uh, but historically, <laughs> Pali is something like foundation. Uh, the Sanskrit tradition, I think, sun. So we mainly belong to the sun. Sans Sanskrit, <laughs> yeah. So when preparing my talk, I took some confidence that I would be talking about Theravada Buddhism and not uh, Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, but then as I prepared my talk, um, I, well, when I started, I thought, yes, I, I understand these things quite well. And then I started thinking about them more in the context of this dialogue. And I thought, actually, I, I'm not sure that I understand this. <laughs> it's quite difficult. Um, one of the problems, it seems to me, in the dialogue between um, science and Buddhism with regard to the understanding of the mind and attention is that the discussion is usually carried out in English and we use um, English words for Buddhist concepts, but sometimes these terms are not very well or, or precisely defined. So. Um, this afternoon, what I want to try to do is to look at the Theravada understanding of what might be broadly called attention, the kinds of things that um, Anne Treisman was talking about this morning. So I want to look at the Theravada understanding of some of the technical terms and see if we can at least unpack, get a clearer idea of how the Theravada tradition defines these terms. I think a lot is um, in common with Indo-Tibetan Buddhism, but also some differences. And sometimes the differences are um, instruct instructive. They sharpen the understanding of things. So. Uh, I think when, I think actually, in the reality, Indo-Tibetan uh, Buddhist tradition, actually a combination of Sanskrit and Pali. Mm. So if we make sort of distinction, Pali tradition and Indo-Tibetan tradition, I think it may create confusion. So that, uh, like uh, Abhidhamma Goshakarika, mainly, you say the the, uh, the real source is Pali tradition. Except, uh, and also, you see, there are Devas Association with the Yoruba. So, this is the Jangui Mekanshi Mekanshi, Devas Association with the Yoruba. Also, there are um, texts that belong to the different sub schools of <coughs> Vaibhashika tradition. Oh. Then, I just don't give Pajin Devas Zoche, Shegi Yoruba, Kaza. Thank 
because of Nalanda tradition, those Nalanda master, I think they also top scholar of Bali. And on top of that, uh, top scholar of uh, Sarvasti Vada. Mm. So his holiness's mm. point is that although the monastic lineage that the Tibetans inherited is that of Sarvasti Vada tradition, but within the texts that are studied, they are also uh, texts that belong to the other sub-schools mm. of Vaipashika, it's not just Sarvasti Vada. Uh, so Bali tradition, mm. so mm. into Tibetan tradition, yes. Bali tradition included. Yes. So that the uh, your chat. Anyway, what the definitions that I will talk about today come only from uh, Theravada Pali texts. That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. So, um, just to give a quick outline of what I will talk about. So, first of all, I'm going to talk about the mental factors involved in simple awareness according to Theravada Buddhism, these Chaitasakas. <laughs> then I want to talk about mental factors involved in more complex uh, kinds of awareness. Then I'm going to talk a little bit, if I hope, about Buddhism and tightrope walking. <laughs> 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 you will explain later, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and maybe then I will talk about four courses of awareness as they are understand, understood in Theravada Buddhism. This will become clearer later. <laughs> and finally, maybe a little bit about Buddhism and map making, making maps. <laughs> <laughs> Would you explain what you mean by map making? Kind of? uh, how to, to make a, a, a map, map of oh, yeah, um, when we go out in a city or in oh. a country we don't yeah. know, we need a map. And in a way, I think the Buddhist understanding, maybe even the scientific understanding, mm -hmm. is a bit like a map of the mind. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, first of all, simple awareness. Mm. So, the most simple kind of awareness that there is, according to Theravada Buddhism, is, has this na name citta. So, citta is defined very simply as consciousness of an object. That's all that is, seems to be said. But, as in the uh, Vaibhashika tradition, you, this consciousness of an object cannot occur in isolation, it always occurs with other mental factors. So the most, in fact, in fact, the most simple kind of awareness in Theravada Buddhism involves citta and at least seven other factors. Mm. They give a list of seven. We mentioned this yes. yesterday. Mm. So, um, the factors are, are quite familiar. Uh, in fact, all of them are mentioned in, in Sarvastivada sources, but not all of them are considered um, universal to all consciousness. So, the factors are Consciousness plus contact, feeling, vedana, perception, sangnya, willing or volition, chaitana, one pointedness, jitai kagrata, life, jivatindriya, then attention. We we'll say for the moment, manas, manaskara. So how does uh, how how does the tradition define jiva indriya? Ah, jiva. Yeah. <laughs> this was one of the ones that I was not uh, going to talk about. <laughs> A difficult question for me. <laughs> um, it is. I think it is simply 
a mental counterpart to the physical counterpart. So some kind of matter has to have jiva, jivatindriya. In the Theravada system, they also say that the mind needs jivatindriya to be alive in some way. That is, so it is what makes consciousness alive. It sustains it. This is Yuda. Son is chain. What are you talking about? Daddy, son is chain. In Abhidhamma Kosha, Jiva Indriya is, you know, defined as life force. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what is a life force? It's the basis of uh, warmth mm -hmm. and uh, consciousness. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's very vague and quite circular. The mudi be saw mu pena de di jiru be anda kare kare kusa jiru be kare tanku be tanku na saw mu jishi ba. So in the so is wondering because in, if you look at Jaina taxonomy of reality, oh, yes. they have nine, um, you know, kind of primary facts. And one of which is the life force. Yes, He's yes. wondering how are they defining that? <laughs> so this should be common. It should be common. Yes. One reality. Yeah. Not like Atma or Anat Atma. Yeah. Uh, I think this is common. Yes, so I think it is. We can, we can seek some kind of easier sort of understanding. Uh, understanding about these things. Well, Buddhist explanation failed. I think we should seek from China. <laughs> like that. Okay. Um, so, although there are eight qualities involved in the most simple kind of awareness, chitta plus the seven, I want to focus on just four of them mm -hmm. because it seems to me that these are very relevant to the kind of discussion mm -hmm. we had this morning. So, I have already... Um, said something about citta. It is just this bare consciousness of an object. It's nothing else. But it needs these other factors in order to fully be conscious. So I want to talk about no. this one. No. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about perception now, one-pointedness, and attention, these ones, their definition. So the first one, perception. So this is how it is... Sanya. So this is how it is defined in the... Theravada text. It says it has the characteristic, characteristic of perceiving. Mm. Not very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Though actually, this is an, I think it is important that it uses um, an action word. Yeah. Perceiving. Yeah. It is an event. It is right. something that happens. So its function is to make a mark on the object that is a condition for perceiving again that something is the same thing. So you make a mark. So this is like a carpenter making a mark on a piece of wood. This seems very clear. And it manifests by producing the idea, the sanya, that corresponds to the mark that has been observed. So... <laughs> It's quite close to the Sarvastivada. Yeah. Good. Mm. So th this seems to be perception in a particular kind of technical sense. It's very specific. So it's to do with categorizing and putting labels on things. And it seems to me that it is understood as a kind of mental filing system. You put 
what you have uh, perceived in the right boxes. Um, the fact that it is to do with making uh, a mark means that it is clearly important for the Theravada understanding of how memory works, since memory is also a matter of recognizing things and recalling things and comparing present experience with past experience. So it's very important for memory, this uh, category of sanya. So... So here, memory, you're talking about sati? No. <laughs> Memory, this is a difference, I think, yeah. between Theravada and um, Vaibhashika, Sarvastavada, that they put much more emphasis on sanya as to do with memory. In the Pali tradition, um, sati, smriti, is exclusively um, Kusala, wholesome. We, I will talk about this. Mm. Mm. So, um, we are checking because in the Tibetan system we have Abhidhamma and, and Samuchaya system. Yes. Mm. So here the Abhidhamma Kosha perspective may be more, more mm. relevant. Yeah. <laughs> so it's also important to understand that. Um, from the Theravada perspective, and I think probably from the Sarvastavada perspective as well, Sanjanya doesn't necessarily perceive what is there. It can get things wrong. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so uh, this is an example given in the text. When young animals look at a scarecrow, you, a scarecrow is here? Mm -hmm. They see they get the idea, they get the perception, people, person, yes, yes. we hope, <laughs> or the farmer hopes. <laughs> and again, um, one year from now, when I uh, try to recall what happened mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. I will maybe have a different sanya from other people. So sanya can be quite different, it doesn't correspond to reality, as it were, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Because in the in the bare sense, from the Sarvastiva point of view, Samnya means discrimination and recognizing something as it is. Mm -hmm. So it uh -huh. could be totally mistaken, mm -hmm. but you can still think that's it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. I think that's... So the next factor important in attention I want to talk about is this one, one-pointedness. Because mm -hmm. there were some... So this is uh, omnipresent, omnipresent mental factors. This one, yeah. Chitta Kagata. Chitta Kana, yes, yeah. omnipresent. Uh -huh. what, in, for Theravada, uh -huh. it is omnipresent. Uh -huh. He is asking about Samnya. Samnya is omnipresent. Also omnipresent. Yeah. 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 So that's the same. Yeah. 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 So the, this morning there was some discussion of one pointedness. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, definition uh, is important. So. This chitta kagata, I think, as was said this morning, is a term for samadhi when it occurs in any kind of consciousness. So the 
Theravada is saying that there is a small element of a seed of samadhi yeah, yeah. in every kind of yeah. consciousness. So generally, um, if you look at many of the qualities that the Buddhist, if you, uh, generally the Buddhist perspective is that if you look at many of the qualities that the meditators are cultivating, whether it is single-pointedness of the mind or uh, vipassana, these are qualities that arise from you know a natural faculties yeah. that remain in the form of mm. seed mm. Uh, naturally present in, yes. in all of us yeah so shamatha attainment of shamatha is function of perfecting and developing the single pointedness okay um I just want to look at the definition because it seems to me quite important. Mm. So the definition, its characteristic is not wandering away, <laughs> not <laughs> being distracted. Its function is to make the qualities that have arisen congeal, like stick binding, together. Yeah. Mm. So it is, this is old fashioned, it's like water mm. binding together soap powder. powder to make a ball of soap. <laughs> so even in the case of, uh, say, uh, a distorted awareness, one mm -hmm. would expect some degree of this eka, chitta eka ga, gata. Yes. Yeah. For the Theravada. For the Theravada. Oh, yeah. Oh. So, because His Holiness is saying that this is the same perspective from the Abhidhamma Kosha, and uh -huh. for the time being, He's saying, <laughs> you know, leave Abhidhamma Samuchaya aside because my personal preference is for <laughs> Abhidhamma Samuchaya. <laughs> so, what it, for the Theravada, I think it's important to understand that one pointedness is not trying to make the mind stay with the object. It is actually the mind resting on the object. Risha. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not a matter of effort. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So concentration is easy. Okay. You know that you have concentration when it is easy to stay with mm. the object. Mm. There is no tendency to wander. I think this is important for attention. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's also important to note that for the Theravada, you can be very concentrated, mm -hmm. but no mindfulness. So can you explain that? <laughs> so if I watch the television, I am very concentrated on watching the television, but this is not really mindfulness. Or if I have a nice meal, uh, I sit and eat, and I have no attention for anything else, so I'm very focused and concentrated. I don't have to make my mind pay attention to this. ちょっと待って。あんた
So it's all in his own brain. Yeah. What about people who seem to be very focused and mindful in what they're doing? Wrong doing. And maybe destructive. completely destructive in a destructive activity. Would you say there is no mindfulness there? For the Theravada, the they have to say that it is not real mindfulness. mindfulness. Yeah, yeah. Str they say strong, oh. strong uh, attention, attention. And, but strong concentration, strong sanya, but no real mindfulness. So on this question, I'm interpreting. Mm. So on the question, are you virtually equating mindfulness as a mental factor with right mindfulness? Yes. ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ。ちばれ
processes, we would find both Chetana and Manasikara. Mm -hmm. That is correct, yes. Um, there is a, a distinction. This is, I, I feel, this is like a, a Geshe exam, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a horrible feeling I may fail. Another <laughs> bit. So it's only saying that this is, this is uh, nothing to do with the Gishi exam. So we're all trying to get together and yes, see if course, we can expand it? our understanding. Uh, no, I'm just suddenly worried that I cannot remember the right answer. <laughs> I th there is an answer to the oh. question, but I feel like the student mm -hmm. who can't remember it. <laughs> and back to the question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping to distract attention. <laughs> Yeah. It's only to say that in the yeah. debate context, if the, the person who is sitting for the exam says that you know, it's proving to be difficult, then you are emboldening the person who is asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> I should not admit <laughs> it's true. <laughs> okay, um, okay I... <laughs> there is a distinction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So the reason why is, you know, to give a little background. Yeah. Mm. So Lawrence was saying that um, when he has been exposed with the um, um, Abhidhamma Samuchaya's mm -hmm. listing of the five omnipresent factors, putting um, feeling as the first one. Yeah. Um, in, in the list, it's always the first one. Mm -hmm. So he has never really been comfortable that something isn't quite right here. Yeah. Then later on, because he feels that um, in terms of the actual development, it is the intention, the chetana should come first, mm -hmm. which then leads to manasikara. Mm -hmm. you know, um, sorry, the, the intention and then to attention and then so on. But then later he read uh, another text by um, Asanga, um, Shravaga Bhumi, mm. which is um, the levels of the Shirva levels of Shravaga, where Asanga has a much more detailed explanation where he talks about um, the, uh, the, the intention being the first one. And mm. then, you know, uh, intention is the one factor that turns the mind to the object and manasikara or attention selects from the field of experience what mm -hmm. one wants to attend to, and then uh, comes the uh, perception or, or uh, yeah. discrimination, and then which then leads to uh, um, and then sorry, the contact, and then contact leads to the feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So which he, his holiness feels is a kind of phenomenologically a kind of a more, more. Is a more understandable kind of a sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so because he's, he's still quite unsettled, so that's why he's asking you these very <laughs> probing, mm -hmm. specific questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it, it is. Yes. No. Yes. 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 Asking these questions out of pure heart, <laughs> 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 wanting to learn something. I, I think the, the, the Theravada makes a distinction between Chaitana that is more active, that is really active, and Chaitana that is somehow v almost dormant. Yeah. It is still there. Uh -huh. So Chaitana is is Simba. is more like the kind of director. I think one 
One simile, if I remember correctly, for Manasikara is it's like a rudder. I need to interject. Yeah. To include all the scientists. We're yeah. giving, asking for them to have a very steep learning curve here. Yeah. <laughs> but if you can keep with the English, because you've made one-on-one -on -one translations, that uh, Manasikara and Shet and, and so forth, if you can use the English, I think it okay. will be helpful for everybody. Mm. Sorry. Mm. Yeah. So Chetana is volition or intention? Which volition or intention can be more active and can be almost dormant. So in the dormant state, it is not really, it's taking a back seat. It's, it only, sorry. 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 So, in connection with Chetana, the intention, uh, there's a discussion in the Sarvastivada of karma, mm -hmm. which are uh, in the form of Chetana, intention, and then the intended karma. Uh, are these distinct, is these distinctions drawn in the in the Theravada tradition as well? So, um, you want to bring this up? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. There's the, within karma, there's a very important distinction mm. in this tradition anyway, the Inter-Tibetan, between voluntary and involuntary behavior, mm -hmm. action. If it's involuntary, then it's a very different type of action than where there's a full intention behind it. Yes. So killing a fly accidentally, you just step on it, you never saw it, whereas seeing a fly and then hitting it like that, yes. these are two very different actions. Yes. So the question is, Hong is just now posed, is making this very reasonable. So, um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I thought <laughs> A distinction is drawn between karma in the form of an intention which mm. leads to the action and the intended karmic act. So you have an intention to do something and then th this leads to an actual action which is the outcome. Mm -hmm. So the actual action is the intended karma, karmic action and the intention that gives rise to is the karma in the form of an intention. So, uh, so here the, use, the same term is used, chetana, or intention. So um, is that the same as the five omnipresent factors? Or because here, in the context of karma, then it's not a dormant intention, because it is leading no. to an actual physical and verbal act. Yeah. I, what I wanted to say, in the simplest kind of awareness, yeah. when we simply, as we were talking yesterday, see color, yeah. or hear sound, Mm. Before you react, mm. because chaitana is or volition, intention is in some sense present, present. In, but in that simplest awareness, it is just dormant. It is not really doing anything very much. Mm. You <laughs> So, let us move on. <laughs> ah. So, what I just wanted to contrast, uh, finally, um, attention, or I have put here also bringing to mind, maybe is perhaps a more 
vivid way of translating in English. But in contrast to concentration, concentration rests on the object, mm. attention turns to the object. Mm. Um, concentration is very important. Yeah, but in order to have to concentration, you need to apply manasikara, attention. Yes. Mm. They must be there, all mm. seven. Mm. So, just as I was saying briefly, this kind of simple awareness with just the seven factors mm -hmm. is only occurs only occurs for colors sounds smells tastes right at the moment of sensory input at that first moment after that there must be more than these seven it must be more okay So, whenever we begin to, uh, to pay more attention, <laughs> Uh, to, uh, or begin to engage with something, you have to have more factors. Um, first of all, there are six listed. Um, I give the... Sinanın so, given that these are, you know, uh, present in all instances yeah. of very simple awareness, is the implication that they are simultaneous? Yes. The seven mental factors are simultaneous. For the Theravada, they... So even in the Sarvastivada tradition, it seems it's simultaneous, but His Holiness was thinking <laughs> that there needs to be some sequence, however brief, they may be, because if you look at the five omnipresent factors listed, um, feeling, sim you know, intention, then brings the manasikara, and there seems to be, there needs to be some sequence here, but his holiness is saying maybe he is wrong, completely <laughs> off, the, I think according, according <laughs> off, the, off the mark. According to them also, <laughs> seems now, because my, my view is wrong. <laughs> I'm just reporting what the... Tradition says. Yes, from yeah. <laughs> um, so when we try to pay more attention, more deliberately pay attention, we have factors like thinking of vitakka, examining vichara, commitment. Is Don't is, uh, Don't uh, Don't vitarka vichara. Yeah, vichara right? yeah. uh, commitment ad adimoksha. So I want to focus a little on these two, Vitaka and Vichara, because they are very important. Um, in, I think, applying the mind, in attention. So, 
vitaka. I have translated it as thinking of. I don't know how else to translate. So it's characteristic. Its characteristic is to lift the mind onto the object. Its function is persistently to strike the object. It manifests as bringing the mind close to the object. This is the traditional definition. So, in contrast to Manasikara, which simply seems to be the mind. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So in contrast, Manasikara seems to be just moving, turning to the object. Mm-hmm. Vitaka mm-hmm. is pushing the mind mm-hmm. onto the object. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that so makes more sense. more deliberate. Um, Next, vichara. Uh, um, so, would you say that they belong to the kind of category of more of an intelligence type? Is that Some, branch, type? That is also said, so that when you do a lot of intellectual thinking, mm. you need yes. this Don't kind of vitaka yeah, yeah, yes, and vichara. But also it is very important in the Theravada account and probably in the Indo-Tibetan account, it's very important for samatha meditation to use this to keep the mind on the object in the theory. Mm. Okay. Yes. So, vichara is then by means of vichara the mind wanders over an object. Um, so it is um, exploring the object constantly. So just an aside, um, in the presentation of the jhana states, mm-hmm. so the four form f- levels of form state and four formless states, yeah. would you say the presentations between the Theravada and Sarvastivada are pretty much same. similar? Same, yeah, same, same. I think, yeah. So um, vichara is exploring the object, wandering over it. Its characteristic is constant rubbing of the object. So Vitaka strikes, Vichara rubs. <laughs> In the Abhidhamma Kosha, um, His Holiness was saying, the, citing the verse which says that Vitaka and Vichara, um, these two are like a, a, a more rough kind of coarse approach and a more finer approach. Okay. And this, that's the distinction right. yeah, drawn. But, so, m- my conclusion or interpretation is that vichara seems to be a kind of close attention to mm-hmm. the details of the object. So, th- this understanding of vitaka and vichara is brought out, I think, very well by some similes that they use. So, yeah. when you want to... Uh, clean a pot, mm. you, one hand holds mm. it, vi- this is mm. vitaka, the other hand polishes. So, this or like a... Yes. It's all in wondering whether vijara is, for vitaka it's good enough simply to hold the object. Wouldn't there be some form of analysis application involved? Well, yes, I, this is when I, w- I was thinking this morning that Vitaka and Vichara are particularly relevant to what Anne Treisman was talking about this morning. What she called um, focused attention mm-hmm. 
attending to the details seems to be something similar to this vichara exploring. So that, and um, the, the other one, uh, dis distributed attention, mm -hmm. in a way is more vitaka. You can immediately get the general picture. But if you need to examine something, put things together, vichara has to be very mm -hmm. active, which seemed to, so there seemed to be some mm -hmm. parallel here to, to the understanding. Okay. So, um, when so, uh, so far I have been talking about very basic, simple kinds of awareness. So, but whenever you are aware of an object, according to Theravada, you as the mind immediately begins to engage with the object. This is involuntary. <laughs> it does it, whether you like it or not, most of the mm -hmm. time. Um, so you, the engagement with the object can be virtuous, uh, unvirtuous, akusala, if it is motivated by attachment, aversion, or delusion. Mm -hmm. Or it is wholesome, if it is motivated by friendliness, um, non-attachment. Wholesome, the unwholesome, yeah, you can go as well. Give me the long. Yeah. That's a good case to do that. Um, so, both the unwholesome and wholesome uh, kind of engagement with an object will involve um, some vitaka and vichara. This yeah. But they will also involve very many other factors. So, according to the Theravada, if there is, a, for example, a wholesome, a wholesome uh, engagement with the object, there will be 21 or 22 simultaneous. This is again in the same moment. <laughs> <laughs> あ、ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ。ケアショップ
so this may be going off a little bit of tangent, but you know, see, Zolan is slightly worried that in getting into this kind of detail with this discourse, some of you might be feeling a little bored. This analysis is actually very extremely interesting, and some of us are turning to think how it maps onto decomposition into microprocesses uh -huh. that are that all go together to make up what we would call attention. So attention is this overall uh -huh. set of microprocesses, and you're unpacking all of those. So that then the follow up on the question, <laughs> because in the Abidama system, <laughs> <Kosha, laughs> so in the Abidama Kosha system, there are 10 universal wholesome factors. Yeah. Um, these are. Um, uh, so you have Shraddha, which is the faith or confidence. This is the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so, uh, so these are uh, shraddha, faith or confidence, heedfulness, which is aparamada, and So then you have Xinjiang, which is the how do you translate it? Pliancy. Uh, or pliancy or tranquility. This is, this is, yeah. um, which is what is the Sanskrit term for that? Um, prashapta. Mm -hmm. And then uh, equanimity, uh, upeksha, and then water, uh, hiri, is the sense of shame, um, Same. Te, um, which is yeah. Same. yeah, and then uh, two root roots, which are um, uh, non-attachment and non-aversion. Same. Um, number seven, non-harming. Yeah, and then virya. So these are the so these are the yeah. ten. So his holiness is wondering what more is there on the Theravada list. Just on nine. No. I, I will Just on nine, huh? Nineteen. So, so, so I mean, nineteen means on the, on the, on the top of ten. That is. Which no, 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 no. mentioned. <laughs> Actually, I will, list, I will say more okay, okay. A, a bit later. Okay. The full list. Okay. Right, right, right. Good. I, w I wanted to say something about mindfulness because this word is used so much. And the more I think about it, I'm not sure that I really know what it means. <laughs> um, you mean the so English term? The English term, term. and even, I am, if I am honest, I'm not sure that I fully understand Sati. the Buddhist, the Theravada Buddhist understanding. So, but I will want to say some, give some features that are brought out. So the first thing is simple, it is remembering in the sense of not forgetting or not losing the object. Then it is also said to be, so this seems to be a kind of, I think what the neuroscientists refer to was uh, psychology as, as a kind of short-term memory. memory. They use working this. Memory. Yeah. Or, or working memory. Working, working memory, memory. memory is one. Yeah. No. No. Short-term. Short <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the other characteristic that is brought out, it is, is said not, it is not bobbing about, not floating on the surface of the object. It is not like when there is no mindfulness, the mind floats on the surface like a, a, a ball on the, bobbing about on the surface of the water, it says. So mindfulness enters into or plunges into the object. So it's a, like a post firmly established in the object. Mm -hmm. The other very important feature of mindfulness is guarding. It's a doorkeeper, mm -hmm. gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. 
So it stands guards at the, at the gate of the senses and it makes sure that in, in the Theravada case here, unwholesome qualities okay. do not enter. It mm. stops them. Mm. Uh, mm. They can't come in mm. unnoticed. Rupert, can I ask for a quick clarification? Does sati mindfulness keep unwholesome uh, qualities from entering or from entering unnoticed? I think the idea, because it's unwholesome, is that if you see that they're trying to enter, the doorkeeper would say, you can't come in. <laughs> You're not allowed. <laughs> 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 So his solace is wondering this <clears throat> from the Sarvasdivada tradition we have a separate mental factor called Abramada, heedfulness, yeah. and what the role specific role of this heedfulness is 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 to is it heedfulness that is guarding the door okay. of the senses or is it mindfulness that is guarding the door of the senses? So we were wondering within the Sarvastivada tradition, the distinction between the two. Right. I think obviously the, the Theravada takes some of the qualities of Apramada and sees it as a, somehow a unified thing. That seems to be the, yeah. the case. Kota, <laughs> 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 I brought the text. Uh, oh. no, I was just <laughs> trying to figure out what is the sequence between mindf application of mindfulness and abramada mm -hmm. in the Sarvastivada tradition, <laughs> whether it is abramada, the heedfulness that is leading to mindfulness, or whether it's the mindfulness that is leading to heedfulness. ตันตันขาสุเลยเป็นคลาสเลยก็ตัวจ๊ะจ๊ะมึงจะเอาตัวหูมึงจะเอาตัวหูมึงจะเอาตัวเส้นตัดที่เต็มไปจนสุดๆ
the sense that he or she is a monastic member and I'm not mm -hmm. supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. So his holiness feels that heedfulness, abramada, is not really specific to any particular uh, context. It's more of a diffused sense of, yes. overall sense of cautiousness, yes. which, which gives you this sense of cautiousness. Or conscientiousness, I think. やばいよ。じしゃしゃしょうろだ。うん。けさまなんかいうすのにね、僕はやじ。じしゃしょうろね。あれな。うん。あれ、ごくまだ。ちょちょみょうされ。から全部ですまれ。全部が取れ。あ
the, the science, I think uh, David yesterday applied a uh, scientific model to Buddhist meditation. Here I think we can apply a Buddhist model to some ordinary activity. Well, not quite ordinary. <laughs> 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 but... <laughs> Non-Buddhist. A non-Buddhist. Non so, um, now you can see, see a broader view. <laughs> what it seems to me is that to do this, this man must have developed perfect mindfulness and concentration mm -hmm. and in balance. Cool. If he becomes, and it also illustrates something about concentration and mindfulness, if he becomes uh, too concentrated, so if he loses concentration and starts thinking, oh, I'm on a wire, 1,000 feet in the air, if I make a mistake now, I, I, I will fall and die, he will become frightened and he will wobble. Right. And he will finish. <laughs> If he becomes too concentrated on um, what his feet are doing and too focused, mm -hmm. then if the wind Did changes the and the wire moves, he, he, he will not be able to mm -hmm. balance. But the most interesting thing, uh, so he needs this presence of mind to do this. One of the interesting things I find about this, and I, when he talked about it afterwards, he said when he was here, he was not frightened at all. He's smiling. It's a man, yeah, sorry. Seventies. <laughs> <laughs> French. 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 Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> Is this okay, Stu? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you're fine. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to do a smile. Yeah. Um, as a presenter, I would like to interject, not as an interpreter. <laughs> um, when he's doing this, are you suggesting that he's actually, this action is itself a virtuous action that's going to lead, from the Buddhist perspective, to a fortunate rebirth? Because mm -hmm. you say it's mindfulness. Yes, I am. I, so I, what is virtuous about that? If he does it ten times, he goes to higher realms of rebirth? I think it, no, I no, think no. he... <laughs> that, that is the... That is the... That, <laughs> that is the, the implication of what I'm saying, and okay, okay. I am happy, personally, sure. with that implication. I think this is a kind of m mindfulness of, of body, a kind yeah. of samadhi, okay. almost. No question, mindfulness. His <laughs> 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 yeah. is that, that it's very mindful is for sure, whether it's wholesome in the Buddhist sense, his holiness feels would depend on the motivation. I, I, okay, I'm not saying, I <laughs> don't want to, to say, my understanding would be from the, the, the Theravada analysis, it, in that moment, there may be, there must be some wholesomeness. After he is finished, I don't know. I, but but the, the motivation is interesting because he, he did say he wanted to do this because for other people, that it was something beautiful to do, for no other reason than that. Mm. He said that. Then it's also. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to say something about this because it relates to what I think Anne talked about this morning. According to the Theravada understanding of being aware of an object. Um, there are different courses. So the, you can be an, aware of an object and fully engage with it. Or sometimes you don't fully engage. So this f is the first course. You, when an object comes into view or is present, you turn to the sense door. This is very the initial turning. Then you see or hear, or smell, or taste. 
This is very simple awareness of the sense object. You then begin to process the data according to the tradition. This needs a little vitaka and vichara, but only vitaka and vichara. It is not wholesome or unwholesome, this part. You then engage with the object, and this area, in, when you engage with the object, it will either be kusala or akusala. It must be one of the two. Give me, give me. Give me. Finally, you register the object in some way. You note the object. And they give a simile, which I think makes it clear. So, a man sleeps beneath a mango tree. The wind disturbs the branches. A mango falls, and he is disturbed. So, this is just turning to the sense door. The man opens his eyes and sees the mango. So, this is the basic seeing, the basic sense data. He then picks up the mango, presses it, smells it, mm, and decides that it's tasty, ready to eat. So this is just beginning to process the data. Still quite simple awareness. He then eats. This is wholesome or unwholesome engagement with the object. And then he... Mm, tasty. That was a good mango. This is registering the object. Mm -hmm. Every mental state has to be either wholesome or unwholesome. There's, nothing, there's no ethically... New at this stage, at this stage... Oh, but there is on other occasions. No, 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 no. All the, everything up to here is not... Ethically neutral, then. Is, is ethically neutral. neutral. Everything okay. up to the point of gauging with the object. And even after... <laughs> so only the eating oh. of the mango, that is where you do something wholesome or unwholesome. So if, you eat, if you're eating a mango, it has to be either wholesome or unwholesome. It cannot be ethically neutral. No. Well, not eating a mango. Eating a mango is... The, is, the mental state, the mental is state a, while eating a mango has to be... No, 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 no. We're not eating a mango. Eating a mango is just a metaphor for metaphor. that stage. Pushing <laughs> 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 For example, um, if someone, out of a pure motivation, decides to do a charitable act, mm. and then the moment that intention has been set, it, it is said that even when the person is walking towards... <laughs> yeah, so this is an altruistic motivation. Mm. Even when he's walking towards the person, you know, other person to give... You know, or the place. Or the place. Right from there, the koshala process has begun, wholesome yeah. process has begun. So it, the, the, the kind of... Um, um, so he hasn't met the object, come into contact with the person, and the act has not been actually done, but koshala or, or you know, wholesome processes have already begun. Yes. Yes. But, but, but this is, this is a, a metaphor, a simile for something that happens very fast. Very fast. This, is not, a, this is not a simile for a full course of action. I just want to, I must finish, but I just want to say something because it's relevant to, I think, to what Anne was saying this morning. So this is, the first one is called very great. So you go through all the stages. Mm -hmm. There is then one which that lacks the last stage. You engage with the object, but it's not registered. There is then a stage, it's slight. You turn to the door, you see, you process the data, but then you don't pay attention. So it's as if you half attend to it. You don't fully, you know something has happened, you have actually registered it, in, not in the full sense, but you're, it, it's come in, but you don't, do anything with it. And then finally, there is one the the sense is just disturbed, but you don't go. And it seems to me that this slight and very slight may be relevant to what Anne was talking about this morning, when things slip into the mind, as it were, unnoticed, and don't get to the top level. Um, but I have gone so long, so I, I, I must stop. So. 
I cannot tell you about maps. But <laughs> <laughs> I will read. Shall yeah. I read out my questions? So I mean, you, you can finalize or if you want to go on to the conclusions. Fine, I will just read, read my conclusions. Interacting. Okay. So, um, there's a conclusion and, and question. So, for Theravada Buddhism, the, the wholesome mind is a kind of rich and full awareness that feels good. Mindfulness is a very important aspect of this awareness, but needs to be understood in relation to other mental factors that all contribute to this kind of awareness. Now, this is a question we partly already raised. So, if, the tightrope, if tightrope walking develops mindfulness and concentration, is there any difference between it and traditional forms of Buddhist meditation? Could it be a form of Buddhist meditation? Some people in the room might get worried in case they get given this as the... <laughs> in fact, there is a, a beautiful, a similar analogy in, in Shantideva's text. Yeah, it's actually taken from a sutra where um, describing the quality of the alertness of mindfulness and awareness, um, and there was a, the analogy is a prisoner who has been made to carry uh, a pot full of uh, um, sesame oil on his head and has to walk towards a particular destination and, uh, and next to him is a guy who is holding a sword ready to strike you know, chop his head off if he spills even a drop. <laughs> yes, yes. So, very close. <laughs> very close, that's right. Then I had a general philosoph philosophical question. So, are Buddhists and scientists both producing what are maps or models of the mind? Is there a danger that we take our maps too seriously, that we forget that they are just maps and mistake them for reality. Correct. You understand? I I have a, I will just, I hope this perhaps illustrates the point I'm trying to make. This is, a, this is a, from a story written by the man who wrote Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll. So this is a quotation. What a useful thing a pocket map is, I remarked. That's another thing we've learned from your nation, said mine hair, map making. But we've carried it much further than you. What do you consider the largest map that would be really useful? About six inches to the mile. Only six inches, exclaimed my hair. We very soon got to six yards to the mile. Then we tried a hundred yards to the mile. And then came the grandest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to the mile. <laughs> Have you used it much? I inquired. It has never been spread out yet, <laughs> said mine hair. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. So we now use the country itself as its own map. And I, I assure you, it does nearly as well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So there, I will. Wonderful. Oh. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rupert. This was very engaging. Thank you. And I think even quite enlightening to a certain extent that we know that even within the Buddhist context there's not a clear understanding what it actually means, <laughs> mindfulness. But we should just be very careful, I take at least that, from using terms when we're not quite clear what they mean and, and we have had a wonderful presentation uh, of really paving the map without putting it over everything. <laughs> so.
So, um, shall we just come to your question that you had at the end? Because I think that's quite relevant to further discussion. Do you might want to paraphrase? The one about tightrope walking? Yeah. Or no, actually the last one, the oh. philosophical question about Buddhists and scientists. Um, well, I, I, I think uh, m m my point was that um, if when we are comparing science, the, the scientific understanding of the, the world and of the mind, the way the mind works, and the Buddhist understanding of the way the mind works, I'm wondering sometimes what exactly what we, the intention is, the end product is. Obviously, we sharpen our understanding. Do you need to translate? No, that's fine. Um, but are we trying to produce a super map so we combine the Buddhist understanding with the scientific understanding and we get more and more detail? And is there some danger that if we put more and more on the map, that the map seems to be, stops to being useful? Because actually, sometimes a simple map is more useful, more practical than a map that has everything on it. So when you make a map, you must decide what is necessary and essential, not necessarily just put everything on. So this is an open kind of general question. <laughs> 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 Nothing interesting? I'd like to raise a point with Anne and with you, uh, because you made a co very brief comment, Anne, that you didn't, for which you didn't have time to elaborate yesterday, and that is the difference between first person and third person is actually, you felt, primarily a, 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 an issue of how you... Did you do it? I think you were here, yes? But what I understood you to say is that the primary difference is in the way you're using the data. Oh, thank you. Um, with that in mind, and you've just said, the practical use, I would like to put a question to both of you. My understanding of the Buddhist ideal is that for all of the details that we get into in Abhidhamma and so forth, finally we should find some practical application for alleviating suffering, finding happiness, purifying the mind of mental afflictions. That if it has no relevance, I think it's really quite distant from the fundamental motivation of Buddhism. Mm. And so it, it, we, when we ask in the Buddhist context, is it practical, we're saying we have all of this, this model, these maps of all these mental functions, and what are we going to use them for in your meditation, in the purification, in your actual practice of heedfulness, mindfulness, introspection? That's the, pra the pr practicality of it. So the map is really an instrument mm -hmm. to direct you to deeper experience that liberates. Uh, so if this is tr true, then I'm wondering, what finally is the motivation, the purpose of these maps? Is it in simply in order to create a really good map? Or is it now, now that you've created the map, you've published your paper, <coughs> now what? Yeah, I suppose for uh, scientists it is Marbo. Primar Marbo. primarily curiosity. Hmm? It's not on. Okay. Primarily curiosity, but we also hope very much and it's very often confirmed that this can be useful, for example, uh, the neuroscience to medical uh, mm -hmm. applications. Um, and, and it turns out in many cases that there are useful applications, I mean, developing computer programs to simulate human behavior and so on. But we don't necessarily in advance have these purposes in mind. We really, I think, I mean, speaking for myself anyway, want to understand but the other scientists may well have other answers. David, you wanted to make a well, my, short... My comment is not about that issue. Okay. I can... Is this... Something? Yeah. I will comment about that okay. issue briefly. It seems to me that there is a synergy between concern over being practical, useful, beneficial, uh, wholesome, and so forth, and concern over satisfying curiosity. 
you can't have the one without the other and be fully successful. You need to be motivated in all different directions and depending where you are in a particular cycle, you may be motivated mostly by curiosity, puzzle solving, so to speak, which has its own virtues, makes you feel healthy, puts you in a wholesome frame of mind, expands your consciousness like Anne was talking about being happy, and then as a result of the products from that, you go into practical application mode and you figure out how these can be used for engineering purposes to improve uh, the ultimate circumstances in other ways, taking the tools that you have in effect invented and then applying them to improve the situation. Adele, please. Yeah, I, I wanted to come back to Rupert's question because I love the question and it, it didn't get addressed at all. Um, I, I think it, there's a terrible danger of taking our maps as reality. Um, any of our maps are only similes or approximations and they're never perfect. And I think there's a real danger in, in thinking that they're reality because they're only are trying to understand reality, are only approximating reality, our only imperfect attempt at trying to get the whole understanding which eludes us, we only get partly there. And so there's, uh, there's always some truth in the map and there's always some error or something missing. And I think that if we start to mm, take that as the truth, we run into dangers. And I, I think that's a wonderful question and I'd love to have a little more discussion of it. I mean, she? I wanted, I wanted to bring it, I wanted to ask uh, Your Holiness the same question. Um, well, we've mentioned as scientists some of our views of the utility for us in having this conversation. Can you say a little bit more about how, you've, how you think it would be useful from your point of view? Mm. <laughs> So from the Buddhist point of view, although um, it is true that um, from the point of view of the many of the authors who compose this text on mental taxonomy and so on, their ultimate um, aim is to really um, help uh, others to lead to liberation and attainment and so on. But however, in the course of their inquiry, there are also situations and context where it is simply the curiosity and inquiry into the understanding reality that drives you know, part of the inquiry. For example, in one of Maitreya's texts, Ornament of uh, Mahayana Scriptures, he says that uh, without mastery of all five fields of knowledge, uh, one can never be uh, you know, fully knowledgeable. So if you look at the five fields of knowledge, uh, there are, many of them are conventional fields of knowledge, you know, need not necessarily be virtues. For example, you have linguistics, Sanskrit linguistics in it. There is epistemology in, in, in the list. And then there is... Um, so there are, in fact, even within the Buddhist tradition, some people hold the opinion that um, the study of epistemology is necessary only to refute other people's you know, view. It's not necessary if your concern is only attainment of liberation. So uh, what this suggests is... So from that point of view, epistemology is not really part of a, a kind of a, a dharmic process. So, and when we talk about ethically um, um, 
virtues or non virtues. Kazurda nang be shung nang be ta ta ya ko mong kushi ayindu zane chama men ta men wa. However, I mean, have, so having said that, if you look at many of the inc philosophical inquiries that are part of the Buddhist discourse, in order to really get very deeply into this, you do need to have some mastery of epistemology and how to understand you know, how language operates and cognitions you know, pro pro proceed and reasoning proceeds and so on. So without these all, kind all, of... All these are the great master, they are monk, uh, I think the really great master or practitioner, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, all their so, texts or writing are writing, so, full of logic. The way of presentation of Buddhism, not through quotation, but through logic or reason. So that reason is done, logic is done, so, by itself, logic or reasoning is neither virtuous nor non virtuous. So, similarly, the pursuit of Sanskrit linguistics, by itself, we cannot say it's a virtuous pursuit or non virtuous pursuit. Similarly, science is a human activity. If it is motivated by a wholesome mental states, then it will be a virtuous pursuit. And if it is motivated by a very neutral state of mind, it will be a neutral activity. And if it is motivated by unwholesome mental states, it will be a negative and non-virtuous uh, activity. The uh, so with regard to the question of map, um, the, in, in the very act of writing a map, His Holiness was uh, he's saying that there is already an acknowledgement that, that this is a facsimile, that it's not reality because you know, the idea of, you know, in order, if we are going to create a complete map, then we have to draw everything in it, mm -hmm. including this house. But then <laughs> it's an impossible thing to do. Yeah. Uh, each, uh, how many people, and then map too, isn't it? Each person sometimes remains like this, sometimes <laughs> remains like that. <laughs> how? Oh, you cannot represent <laughs> that in the, in the map, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so today, we have map to say, what's the shame we are, mother? So similarly, when we are talking about developing maps of the mind, um, it is really a, a, a question of approximation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we cannot, no one can insist the comprehensiveness of a particular map of the mind. So it's really uh, when developing a map of the mind, much of the perspective is really from a very generic point of view, kind of certain patterns and certain kind of modalities. And, and um, even in Buddhist practice, we often speak about uh, the object of the meditation as being the entire, you know, world, or all, all sentient beings, or just all phenomena. But that does not imply that that person has been able to view it each and every, you know, piece uh, that, you know, constitutes th this totality. Mm. I think one thing I, uh, I remember, I remember uh, I think important is the uh, one Chilean uh, physicist, actually teacher, called David Verona. So uh, this Chilean scientist who was the late teacher of uh, Varela, um, um, sorry, the teacher of late Varela, once said that, uh, you know, as scientists, one should not feel attached to their field of inquiry, which he's always uh, was saying uh, he is very important. He mentioned a physicist, uh, but uh, too much attachment towards his own field is wrong. Mm. So we... Buddhist, but too much attachment to Buddhism is wrong. Then your mind becomes biased. So particularly scientists or scientists or Buddhists who, 
who are trying to investigate. Using Vitaka and Vichara, <laughs> <laughs> the initial application oh, yeah. and find. Most important is your mind should be open. Yeah. Yes. Mm? Mm -hmm. When we carry investigation, no question of wholesome or unwholesome. Uh, unwholesome. Uh, if you should, because you should, so, Gewas Shin Vetuks Chadeva, you know, any pleasure loss will never be. Pleasure loss will never be. So, in the actual act of inquiry, it needs to be completely objective, even not making judgments about whether one is being swayed by wholesome or unwholesome states of mind. Uh, so mind, So even in the Buddhist context, when one is establishing the understanding of the nature of reality, the, uh, the ethical evaluation, uh, consideration or evaluation is not brought upon there. Uh, so, and this model can be appreciated from looking at the way in which the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths. When he first proposed, the, presented the Four Noble Truths, so, um, so when Buddha presented the teachings on the Four Noble Truths, he did not begin with what to do. He presented with the understanding of the Four Truths, saying this is the truth of suffering, this is the truth of su origin of suffering, and so on. Then later said what needs to be done. The suffering must be recognized, origin must be identified, and so on, or, or uh, abandoned. So, uh, in, and, and, and so in the, in the Tibetan, Indo-Tibetan understanding, we speak of... Um, if you look at the Buddha's discourse on the Four Noble Truths, what is called the three rounds of repetition, uh, and uh, um, with mm. four, uh, 12 different um, characteristics. So this must be similar in the Theravada. Yes, yeah. it's the same. Oh, it's yeah. So first, talking about the actual characteristic of the uh, truths. Yeah. Then, uh, talking about the functions of the knowledge. Yes. Uh, which is when the ev ethical ev evaluation is brought in. And then, uh, last, talking about the functions, sorry, the re uh, results of that ethical uh, engagement. Um, uh, so you say mapping or uh, invest through investigation, investigation. Uh, when we find uh, some, uh, some extent, then our generation, I think, fulfill our responsibility. Mm -hmm. Then further investigation will carry our next generation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then investigation always go right, further and further, further, further. Till I think human brain becomes smaller, smaller, smaller. <laughs> then, then no hope. Because of go, mar mar so, on the other hand, if your head is becoming more and more bald, <laughs> then your intelligence is more and more wisdom is coming. <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, so, our progress, because of progress, progress, program. I think we'll continue. Like in the field of, because of the particle. Matter. No? Uh, matter. Similarly, our inner science also will go further, 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 further. So, the so, you know, it's, it's unrealistic to expect someone to come up with a position that this is the final map. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing beyond that. So even in the writings of great masters like Nagarjuna, he never makes the statement that, you know, there's nothing left. <laughs> this is all. I mean, the Buddha himself has said, continue with your inquiry and, and investigation. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so his holiness is not worried about confusing the map with the reality too much. Attachment is not worried about confusing the map with the reality too much. Attachment is not worried about confusing the map with the reality too much. So, 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 But however, the danger will come from too much attachment to one's own field of inquiry. Mm -hmm. And here, if one does fall into that trap, then, you know, we will uh, do something what Tsongkhapa has said in 
uh, Lam Chimo, the great exposition of the stages of the path to enlightenment, where he says that some people will pick up one uh, uh, piece of um, one grain of barley <laughs> and say that, uh, and this is the essence of all the barleys in the world. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there is that danger because you feel so attached to your own particular area of research that you feel that this represents the knowledge of the entirety. Uh, so, from the Buddhist viewpoint, of course, yeah. till our mind becomes Buddha mind, uh, ignorance always there. Yeah. So, knowledge limita limitation yeah. always there. So, nobody can say, oh, my knowledge is complete. Mm -hmm. nobody, nobody can. Right. No. Right. Like that. It's not simply not complete but also not fully accurate. That... That did work. Did yes. It. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Accurate, but yeah. unbiased, what is that? Accurate, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's why we need, you know, unbiased perspective. You know, Open so that, mind, unbiased. Unbiased perspective is a goal, but I don't know if it's ever a reality to get completely unbiased. That's <laughs> Mm. Mm. Uh, a person, uh, for example, I'm Buddhist, uh, but when I invest, when I carry some investigation in certain pe certain things, then uh, I should, I must forget, I'm Buddhist. So then open. Anything can possible. Um, Even you see some contradictory thing, th things may find. So as a result, so, so then as a result of this, for example, when His Holiness is confronted with the fact that modern cosmology negates, undermines the traditional Buddhist idea of Mount Meru centered universe, he, f he doesn't feel un you know, uncomfortable or undermined by this. A absolutely. But what I'm saying is, um, no matter how much I try to not have a New York Jewish perspective, <laughs> I, I grew up in New York and I'm a Jew, and I can't completely escape biases that come from that, no matter how much I try to be open. Um, so you try to be open, but mm, unconscious effects of your experience and your culture and what you've learned come in. So I think we all appreciate that our perceptions are not completely veridical or accurate. And I think it's the same thing with our maps or our theories or our conceptions. We try to be as good and accurate as we can and as unbiased, but we are never completely unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> your, your Holiness, I, I have to follow up just a quick question related to that. If you forget your bu the Buddhist part of your intention, can't, I mean, is that something you can really forget? No. So what this only means is that, for example, when he's engaged in the inquiry of a particular topic, um, what he means is that he needs to, um, you know, uh, suspend the awareness that he is a Buddhist and whatever he finds must somehow accord with the Buddhist position and explanation. Now, for example, I'm Buddhist because of admirer of these sort of great masters. masters. So therefore, I respect Nagarjuna as much as because of the, towards the Ayanga San, Ayanga Sangha, Asanga. Bosuban. But then when in, investigation carry, uh, there are many points dismissed about because <laughs> Arya Asanga or Bosuban's viewpoint. Yeah. So if you use it, uh, your devotion, Reverence. your respect, uh, too strong, then how can Kasoda dismiss this in their word? Right. So it should not come in the way of being able to disagree I'm and refute them. 
Omši kaba. Nare neji. Tadi respect si orva. Nare nare. Tada respect si ani. Ta kaba te gudu zane. Nare. Ani. Omši kaba. Nare neji. Ta nare neji yudu kana mala kana. Duga mar. Nare neji yaza. Nare. Ine tadi chunde dar makub shiva kam duga mar va. Nare. Tam duga mar va. Nare. Ani. Omši kaba. So because of this, because of this need um, to, you know, ensuring that your reverence to say, for example, the Buddha does not come in the way of your ability to, you know, uh, you know critically evaluate his statements. Uh, in, the, in the Buddhist tradition, they evolved a very, you know, complicated hermeneutic approaches where you make distinctions between what is his intended, mm. you know, point and what is explicitly stated. And then the, the contra contradictions that one can reveal if you take the statement at face value. So these kind of strategies are developed where, you know, while maintaining the reverence towards the Buddha, you ha have the ability to disagree what is being stated in a particular scripture. Right. right. The only sure. reason I'm mentioning it, this is the last sentence I'll say, Please. is that sometimes our science, as scientists, our science, which we can bring with full, a good intention to what we decide to investigate, can sometimes be used in ways that may not be good. So in some sense, even though we're trying to be as objective as possible, we have to hold in our mind both our own intention and the potential of other intentions using the science that we're producing. That's where I'm, that's where I'm oh, asking about the in, holding the intention. Oh, medical field is some oh, experiment on animal. Oh. So, in, you know, of course, you might be pointing towards certain forms of inquiry, research, you know, course of research, and the questions about ethicality of that particular line of pursuit. In these situations, then the question is very complex, where you have to really weigh the overall benefit of this versus the, you know, Im, you know uh, implications of dangers and so on. So you really have to weigh the pros and cons. So finally, Mathieu. So, as a French person, I think I have to come back to the tight <laughs> rope. <laughs> to the tight rope. Uh, the example of the tight rope was ambiguous. Mizonis asked about the motivation. And he had a smile. It could be, as he said, for offering of beauty to rejoice people. It could be for fame. But snipers have a very perfect mindfulness. And uh, they also report some kind of enjoyment of hitting their targets. So do hunters. There's a Tibetan verse said that without compassion, you can kill with a smile. So the mindfulness itself, I think, without, as Jonas mentioned, without the motivation behind, it's just a tool. As Jonas said, it's true for grammar, it's true for science. And the state of flow in which maybe mindfulness might bring is similarly neutral, ethically. Uh, you know, surgeons get in the flow for hours, they can carry on an operation, an artist get into the flow, a mountain climber get in the flow, a meditator also can get into the flow. I mean, perfect mindfulness, a turnover of time, and so forth. So the very fact of being mindful is just a, a very well fine-tuned tool that can be then readily used for wholesome purpose. The example of the sniper, they get in the flow, they enjoy it. And so you cannot say, of course, it's a contributing to wholesomeness. So the examples that can, image can be given is like a hammer, can be used for building or for destroying, like fuel that can be used for driving in a car or setting a blaze a, a home. So the motivation has to be the final factor to determine whether that mindfulness is wholesome or not. Would you want to Should I say something? respond to that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to, for the sake of debate, argue the contrary position. If I use... So first, yeah, okay. So, as I see it, the Theravada tradition is trying to point towards a particular state of mind where there is a kind of harmony of body and mind. It feels right. It is, mindfulness is connected with lots of 
other factors, as I've said. So I think it's very clear f for me, if we're just using a tool, say, a workman or something like that, I, th I have no problem myself, I think, wanting, saying that is wholesome without particular reference to the motivation beyond the state of mind. When the workman or musician is absorbed in their task and so forth, I think it is, can be understood as a kind of wholesome mindfulness. There may not be, in the Theravada understanding, there doesn't have to be wisdom or understanding there. That can be absent, but the other factors are there. So there is non-attachment and there is goodwill. I think we've all had the experience when we try to use a tool and we get angry. Then we can't do it very well. Um, and I think that's very important. Now, to go back to the example of the, the sniper, is it unwholesome simply to handle a gun? If I take a gun and use it well, I go with target practice and shoot at a target. No, 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 yeah, let me finish. Yeah. I think in the act of firing a gun at a target, there can be if, a kind of mindfulness and wholesomeness there. I don't see that there is a contradiction. Now, we come to the question of actually pointing a gun and pulling the trigger when it's pointing at a person with the intention to kill someone. I think at this point, if I wanted to answer from the point of view of the, the Theravada tradition, there must be some, of course, this is unwholesome at that point when you pull the trigger to um, kill someone. But I'm not sure that you can say that everything leading up to that act in terms of the mental states would have to be classified as intrinsically unwholesome. I think what the Abhidhamma is saying is that the mind can switch very, very fast from wholesome states to unwholesome states. I think there's a kind of model of the mind that works. So, the, 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 that is the model of the mind that they're trying to put forward. But the but you, I mean, you could have an act that you have decided to do, and once the decision has been made, which is the motivation, and then the act may not be done, say, for a week. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the initial motivation was set a week earlier. Mm. But, but that is uh, the child of the child, so that must be the child. So, yes. but from... So, I mean, for example, in the Sarvasivada Abhidhamma tradition, the distinction is made between... The children, right? um, yeah, this is also common to all mm. other Buddhist traditions. Um, between various types of karma, karma that was done but not acquired, karma that is acquired but not done, and karma that is both done and committed and, and acquired, and karma that is neither committed mm. or acquired. So you can have an intention mm -hmm. but not the action. You can have an action without the intention. I guess the, the issue would be where the... Under the Chala Masa Osadi, Chala Masa Osadi, who you ring you, but then the chairs and the Lord Americans will cut you there. So, you know, you know. Opposite, is it? That's it. Bush was a little turning back. That was it. That in a Kambo Yungu chair is that it? That was what was all. That is, they never go. Send you to Kunomena. So I mean the karmic act that was um, done but not acquired is uh, accidentally stepping on an insect. Mm -hmm. So but while you are doing it, there must be some mental processes going yes, on. Yes. There must be, you know, intention and. Um, but the um, 
A plug both for mindfulness and for maps on the positive pro side as opposed to the con side. With respect to mindfulness, it seems to me that under conditions like Rupert was illustrating, the presence of the mindfulness and the so called flow is actually a positive precursor for becoming enlightened in the sense of experiencing oneness with the overall universe. And I would suspect while he, Philippe, was walking across that wire, he had increased his probability of becoming enlightened because he had to be in a state while going th over that rope where in effect, in effect he was unified and coming close to so-called cosmic consciousness, otherwise there would be no way whereby he could cope with all of the circumstances and survive the, uh, the, the travel across the wire. That's my plug for the mindfulness, in all due respect to Matthew. I think there are certain circumstances where it's more <laughs> than just a tool. It has positive potential laden in it and in fact, probably you would not be able to become enlightened without the mindfulness. And because mindfulness has lightened in it the seed for enlightenment, it in and of itself is a positive. Now for the maps. If you don't take your, if you don't take your maps very David, seriously. David, David, let him, let him respond. Just briefly, yes. yes. If he has a refined tool, he can progress much better towards enlightenment if you use that tool with a wholesome intention. No question that to have an absolutely perfect tool is a big step forward. But that doesn't in no way exclude the need for that orienting that tool. And so the sniper, as long as he trained without any slightest intention to kill, that's just developing mindfulness. But the moment the motivation comes, it completely colors the whole thing. We say a crystal takes the colors on the plot on which it rests. So the whole thing becomes green. It means the whole thing becomes unwholesome. The whole perfect tool of mindfulness becomes completely unwholesome the moment it is applied for a destructive purpose. Rupert had something to say? I, I just want to say very briefly, it, we, the Theravada say that mindfulness is a wholesome factor, it's a, it's, that it's not neutral. So it's a different classification. So in some level, they may be talking about something slightly different from what you're talking about. Well, that was, in a way, my point. I read that it also, imp mindfulness implied the faculty to, in depth, have an insight on what will cause suffering or happiness. Does it contain the understanding of the consequences of what you are, the situation in which you are? In the third element of the definition he gave there, thank you. <laughs> if you look at the first two, they're virtually identical to the definitions of mindfulness in the Inter-Tibetan tradition. There was no reference to any wholesome or unwholesome. But then he brought in the third paragraph. Guarding. And that is the element of guarding and wanting to, orienting towards virtue, orienting away, away from non-virtue. So from the Inter-Tibetan perspective, you could say you're taking elements of heedfulness, incorporating that into the definition of mindfulness, now mindfulness becomes equivalent to right mindfulness, which means, of course, by definition, it's all, always wholesome. Yeah. But this leaves out time, times when we have the first two of your definitions, which are simply the non-forgetfulness, the non-floating, the retention, the recollection. 
It's leaving that out when, when that is applied, as you're saying, but there is no heat. But, in which case, then you parse that out and put it into, into sanya and so forth. Yeah, yes, and it's a slightly different model. Exactly. Yeah. And mm. neither model is <laughs> No. So <laughs> Theravada is, is trying to bring out something about mindfulness that gets lost. <laughs> Because his holiness is wondering because the Theravada definition of mind sati seems to be very similar to the sati in the context of this particular text that you are referring to uh, seems to be um, almost identical to um, the definition developed on the basis of the sati in the context of one of the eightfold um, you know, eightfold path. Eightfold path. Mm. Mm. In which case, it's by virtue of mm. um, its own uh, definition, it is a wholesome state of mind. Yes, but uh, I wanted. Th the point is that I think Philippe had that right mindfulness on right the tightrope. Right. <laughs> so as we can see, there's mm -hmm. much more. There's we still have, fortunately, three days, and we have already reached a little bit over three o'clock. And we're going to make a break here for tea, and so that Your Holiness also can retire for a good night's sleep. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Your Holiness, we're, this morning we have been speaking about the modes of attention, but still there is not quite a clear understanding of what, what attention really is. And we hope that we can elucidate now what attention is from at least the Pani, Pali Canon side. And we're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Rupert Geffen here. He's from the University Buddhist Studies of um, Bristol, and he's also the president of the Poly Polytext Society. And he has written many articles and a wonderful book as an introduction to Buddhism, which is extremely accessible for um, Westerners particularly, to understand what is actually the thought of Buddhism. And I'm really excited to listen now to Rupert's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diego. Uh, it's a great honor of me, for me to uh, um, be invited and to talk to Your Holiness. Um, I find myself in a very odd position trying to explain Buddhism to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is the... the, uh, the but uh, but uh, <laughs> historically, Pali is something like foundation. Uh, the Sanskrit tradition, I think, sun. So we mainly belongs to the Sanskrit. Sanskrit. <laughs> yeah. So when preparing my talk, I took some confidence that I would be talking about Theravada Buddhism and not uh, Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, but then as I prepared my talk, um, I, well, when I started, I thought, yes, I, I understand these things quite well. And then I started thinking about them more in the context of this dialogue. And I thought, Actually, I, I'm not sure that I understand this. <laughs> it's quite difficult. Um, one of the problems, it seems to me, in the dialogue between um, science and Buddhism with regard to the understanding of the mind and attention is that the discussion is usually carried out in English and we use um, English words for Buddhist concepts but sometimes these terms are not very well or, or, or precisely defined. So um, this afternoon what I want to try to do is to look at the Theravada understanding of what might be broadly called attention, the kinds of things that um, Anne Treisman was talking about this morning. So I want to look at the Theravada understanding of some of the technical terms and see if we can at least unpack, get a clearer idea of 
how the Theravada tradition defines these terms. I think a lot is um, in common with Indo-Tibetan Buddhism, but also some differences. And sometimes the differences are um, instruct instructive. They sharpen the understanding of things. So. Uh, I think when, I think actually, in the reality, Indo-Tibetan uh, Buddhist tradition, actually a combination of Sanskrit and Pali. Mm. So if we make sort of distinction, Pali tradition and Indo-Tibetan tradition, I think it may create confusion. So that, uh, like uh, Abhidhamma Koshakarika, mainly, you say the the, uh, the real source is Pali tradition. Except, uh, and also you see there are also there are texts that belong to the different sub schools of Vaibhashika <coughs> tradition. Oh. Uh, Sarvastivada. Mm. So his holiness's mm. point is that although the monastic lineage that the Tibetans inherited is that of Sarvastivada tradition, but within the texts that are studied, there are also uh, texts that belong to the other subschools mm. of Vaibhashika, it's not just Sarvastivada. Uh, so Pali tradition, yeah. mm. so mm. into Tibetan tradition, yes. Pali tradition included. Yes. So that the uh, your chat. Yeah. Anyway, what the definitions that I will talk about today come only from uh, Theravada Pali texts. That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. So, um, just to give a quick outline of what I will talk about. So, first of all, I'm going to talk about the mental factors involved in simple awareness according to Theravada Buddhism, Simjong. these Chaitasakas. Simjong. Hmm? <laughs> then I want to talk about mental factors involved in more complex uh, kinds of awareness. Then I'm going to talk a little bit, if I hope, about Buddhism and tightrope walking. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe then I will talk about four courses of awareness as they are understand, understood in Theravada Buddhism. This will become clearer later. <laughs> and finally, maybe a little bit about Buddhism and map making, making maps. <laughs> <laughs> Would you explain what you mean by map making? Uh, how to, to make a, a, a map, map of... Yes, um, when we go out in a city or in a country we don't know, we need a map. And in a way, I think the Buddhist understanding, maybe even the scientific understanding, is a bit like a map of the mind. Sure. <laughs> so, first of all, simple awareness. So, the most simple kind of awareness that there is, according to Theravada Buddhism is, has this na name citta. So citta is defined very simply as consciousness of an object. That's all that is, seems to be said. But as in the uh, Vaibhashika tradition, you, this consciousness of an object cannot occur in isolation. It always occurs with other mental factors. Use some 
So the most, in fact, in fact, the most simple kind of awareness in Theravada Buddhism involves chitta and at least seven other factors. Mm. They give a list of seven. We mentioned this yes. yesterday. Mm. So um, the factors are, are quite familiar. Uh, in fact, all of them are mentioned in, in Sarvastivada sources, but not all of them are considered um, universal to all consciousness. So the factors are consciousness plus contact, feeling, vedana, perception, sangnya, Willing or volition, chaitana, Sempa. one pointedness, chitai kagrata, life, jivatindriya, and then attention. We say for the moment, manas, manaskara. So, how does uh, how how does the tradition define jiva indriya? Ah, jiva. <laughs> This was one of the ones that I was not uh, going to talk about. <laughs> A difficult question for me. <laughs> um, it is, I think it is simply a mental counterpart to the physical counterpart. So some kind of matter has to have jiva, jivatindriya. In the Theravada system, they also say that the mind needs jivatindriya to be alive in some way that is mm -hmm. so it is what makes consciousness alive, alive. Yeah, okay. it sustains it in Abhidhamma Kosha, Jiva Indriya is, you know, defined as life force. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what is a life force? It's the basis of uh, warmth mm -hmm. and uh, consciousness. Okay. So, <laughs> so, 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 yeah. said it's very vague and quite circular. Jiva <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so in, is wondering because in, if you look at Jaina taxonomy of reality, oh, yes. they have nine, um, you know, kind of primary facts, and one of which is the life force. Yes, He's yes. wondering how are they defining that? Yes, <laughs> so this should be common. <laughs> it should be common. Yes. One reality, yeah. not like Atma or Anat Atma. Yeah. Uh, I think this is common. Yes, so I think it is. We can we can seek some. Uh, the easier sort of understanding. Uh, understanding about these things. Well, Buddhist explanation failed. I think we should seek from China. <laughs> like that. Okay. okay I, um, so, although there are eight qualities involved in the most simple kind of awareness, chitta plus the seven, I want to focus on just four of them, mm -hmm. because it seems to me that these are very relevant to the kind of discussion mm -hmm. we had this morning. So I have already um, said something about chitta. It is just this bare consciousness of an object. It's nothing else. But it needs these other factors in order to fully be conscious. So I want to talk about no. this one. Yeah. So here the Abhidhamma Kosha perspective may be mm. more, more relevant, yeah. <laughs> so it's also important to understand that um, from the Theravada perspective, and I think probably from the Sarvastivada perspective as well. Sanjanya 
doesn't necessarily perceive what is there. It can get things wrong. Mm. So, <laughs> so uh, this is an example given in the text. When young animals look at a scarecrow, a scarecrow is here. Mm. They see, they get the idea, they get the perception, people, person. Yes, yes. We hope, <laughs> or the farmer hopes. <laughs> and again, um, one year from now, when I uh, try to recall what happened mm. here, mm. I will maybe have a different sanya from other people. So sanya can be quite different. It doesn't correspond to reality, as it were, necessarily. <laughs> Because in the in the bare sense from the Sarvastiv other point of view, Samya means discrimination and recognizing something as it is. So it uh -huh. could be totally mistaken, uh -huh. but you can still think that's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. I think that's... So the next factor important in attention I want to talk about is this one, one-pointedness. Because mm -hmm. there was some... So this is uh, omnipresent, omnipresent mental factors. This one, yeah. Chittekakata. Chittekakata. Yes, Chittekakata. Yes, omnipresent. Uh -huh. what, in, for Theravada, uh -huh. it is omnipresent. Chibur, chibur. Chibur. Mm -hmm. He is only asking about samya. Samya is omnipresent. Also omnipresent. So that's the no. yeah. No. So the, this morning there was some discussion of one pointedness. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, definition uh, is important. So this chitte kagata, I think, as was said this morning, is a term for samadhi when it occurs in any kind of consciousness. So the Theravada is saying that there is a small element of a seed of samadhi yeah, yeah. in every kind of yeah. consciousness. So, uh, so generally, um, if you look at many of the qualities that the Buddhists, if you, uh, generally the Buddhist perspective is that if you look at many of the qualities that the meditators are cultivating, whether it is single pointedness of the mind or uh, vipassana, these are qualities that arise from, you know, uh, natural faculties yeah. that remain in the form of mm. seed, mm. Uh, naturally present in, yes. in all of us. Yeah. yeah. So shamatha, attainment of shamatha is function of perfecting and developing the single pointedness. Okay. Um, I just want to look at the definition because it seems to me quite important. Mm. So the definition. Mm. 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 So I'm going to talk about perception now, one pointedness, and attention, these ones, the definition. So the first one, perception. So this is how it is. Sanya. Mm. Sanya. So this is how it is defined in the Theravada text. It says it has the characteristic, characteristic of perceiving. Mm. Not very helpful. Though <laughs> 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 so actually, this is an, I think it is important that it uses um, an action word. Yeah. Perceiving, yeah. it is an event, it is right. something that happens. So its function is to make a mark 
on the object that is a condition for perceiving again that something is the same thing. So you make a mark. So this is like a carpenter making a mark mm. on a piece of wood. This seems very clear. And it manifests by producing the idea, the sanya, that corresponds to the mark that has been observed. So... <laughs> It's quite close to the Sarvastivada. Yeah. Good. Mm. So th this seems to be perception in a particular kind of technical sense. It's very specific. So it's to do with categorizing and putting labels on things. And it seems to me that it is understood as a kind of mental filing system. You put mm. what you have uh, perceived in the right boxes. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it is to do with making uh, a mark means that it is clearly important for the Theravada understanding of how memory works. Mm -hmm since memory is also a matter of recognizing things and recalling things and comparing present experience with past experience. So it's very important for memory, this uh, category of sanya. So... So here, memory, you're talking about sati? No. Sanna. Sanna This is a difference, I think, <laughs> between Theravada and um, Vaibhashika, Sarvastavada, that they put much more emphasis on Sanya as to do with memory. In the Pali tradition, um, Sati, Smriti, is exclusively um, kusala, wholesome. We, I will talk about this. Mm. Mm. So, um, one because in the Tibetan <laughs> system we have Abhidhamma Kosha and, and Samuchaya system. Okay. Yes. Okay. 